we continue then to the uh, second speaker this afternoon, Ihan Aksu, as Albert already said, he's a PhD in the, our project models of textual communities here at uh, Groningen. And Ihan was educated at the University of Amsterdam, uh, at Cambridge University, and then came and worked with us here in, in, in Groningen. He has already published some work, some of you uh, may know it, indeed on the opistographs, and he's right now rounding off his uh, dissertation and presenting some core material from it to all of us. Ihan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Mlad, and thanks to you all, of course, for being here. Um, I will share my screen now. Um, yes. Does this look okay? Yes. Um, in this paper, I would like to present you an overview of some of the issues that I discuss in my dissertation. Um, though I will not talk about digital paleography, I will nevertheless try to interact with some of the topics um, that uh, have been addressed that we talked about during the past days of this, of this conference. And more specifically, I'm interested in how the materiality, the material study of ancient manuscripts, whether to paleography or codicology or so, can help us increase our understanding of uh, both texts and textual communities. And the point of departure here uh, is that behind the manuscripts and groups of manuscripts that we discuss are people, individuals or community communities. And on the basis of these manuscripts, can we think of models of communities that engaged with these manuscripts in different ways? They might have worked or reworked their texts uh, read and perhaps discussed them, collected texts and organized different types of reading events around them. And um, it is these form, forms of use, so to speak, that I would like to turn to. How do we take that step? How do we move from manuscripts to the different ways in which the uh, people behind them engage with them? Um, in this paper, I would like to rethink these questions by turning to one manuscript. Uh, an opistograph which preserves three different compositions or parts of several compositions. So uh, this was all, will also function as kind of a case study to think about uh, the different ways in which individual texts are categorized and grouped together by, uh, by modern scholars. Um, in recent years, more attention has been paid to material evidence when conceptualizing the ways in which the scribes behind the scrolls engaged with the text. Um, a scribe is not a passive agent anymore in a kind of straightforward movement from writer to reader, but rather as George Book reminds us, an actively interested transmitter of the text. So a scribe continuously would have made decisions that determine how a text is read, spread and understood. And in what ways and how long manuscripts are used, stored, and circulated. Um, I would like to refer to a remark by the medievalist Matthew Driscoll, um, who recognized that literary works do not exist independently of their material embodiments, and the physical form uh, of the text is an integral part of its meaning. One needs, therefore, to look at the whole book and the relationships between the text and such features as form and layout illumination, rubrics, and other paratextual features, and not least, the surrounding texts. Um, I am quite intrigued by the notion of uh, the surrounding texts here. Uh, how should we understand this phrase, especially for the kind of material that we try to work with? In medieval codices, many different compositions, of course, could have been written side by side, but how do we know for the Dead Sea Scrolls which texts were read and collected together in antiquity? Is there, a way out, is there a way, for example, to find out which texts were copied, studied, read, or performed collectively by these scribes behind the scrolls? So this internal perspective on collecting, on collection and the practice of collecting, it's difficult to trace back without the kinds of evidence that other fields have at their disposal. You may think, for example, of the Mesopotamian literary catalogues 
or these um, Greek uh, uh, papyrological uh, book lists that we have from, for example, uh, uh, Oxyrhynchus. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we find no explicit reflection on the notion of collection or practices of communal reading. However, the scrolls do provide us with some indirect evidence. We find examples of extracts and note thinking in manuscripts such as, for example, for Q Testimonia that Ibert showed us before. But we may also think of Fortune miscellaneous rules. And it has been argued that these texts uh, can help us with providing evidence for this broad textual pluriformity in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I would maintain that the opistographs from Qumran present us with another opportunity to rethink the literary diversity, the diversity of texts that we encounter in the scrolls. So I try to illustrate this a bit by focusing on one manuscript that contains three compositions. And uh, this papyrus manuscript is an example of an opistograph. So just briefly, this term has been used rather inconsistently, sometimes for scrolls uh, where one continuous text is written on both sides, other times for manuscripts where you find different texts from both the recto, the font, and the verso. Uh, and here I prefer to use it more simply for any manuscript that contains writing on both sides. Um, so let's turn to this opistograph. Um, it's the only opistograph from Qumran that carries three compositions. So 4Q509, 4Q496, and 4Q506 on the slide. Um, there's been some debate whether the recto uh, could even preserve a fourth text, 4Q505, but I will stay away from that here. So this opistograph consists of 313 fragments. On the recto, we find one composition, a text that we now know as Festival Prayers, which passed down to us in three other copies as well. And um, this is a liturgical prayer cycle consisting of prayers dedicated to festivals throughout the, uh, the Jewish liturgical, liturgical year. Based on all manuscripts together, we can reconstruct kind of a range of prayers dedicated to festivals such as Day of Atonement or Tabernacles. And these prayers follow a particular pattern of phrases like remember Lord or Amen, Amen that are kind of repeatedly found in each of these manuscripts, um, which suggests a kind of a very formulaic structure of these uh, festival prayers. Now, if we imagine uh, flipping the scroll in vertical direction, so kind of like this, uh, then we find 4Q496 on the verso on the back side of the first 122 fragments. And this is one of the seven witnesses of the war scroll. Um, there is a continuous scholarly debate regarding uh, many different aspects of this text, such as its genre, its compositional history, the relation between the big 1QM scroll and the other uh, copies of this text. But um, what is important here is to remind ourselves that the war scroll is generally read as one of the compositions that are central to this uh, core group of, of sectarian literature. So the war scroll is one of a limited number of compositions that uses the term serech, for example. Um, this term is not known from uh, classical Hebrew, but appears in many of the texts that are traditionally interpreted as sectarian, such as 1QS or the da Damascus document. And is therefore often thought to have originated at Qumran. The war scroll is also thought to incorporate uh, uh, a number of social religious concepts that are typical for the Qumran sectarian worldview. Uh, when thinking about the ways in which the war scroll potentially was read, several suggestions have been proposed, uh, such as, for example, rule text in preparation of the final war. Uh, scholars have also read sections uh, of the text as a liturgical document which we will return to later. Um, interestingly, both 4Q509 and 4Q496 preserve a couple of these fishhook signs, these paragraphic signs in the margin. Um, on the slide, you can see two here that are placed on uh, both sides of the same fragment, marked here 
and here. And most probably uh, this sign was used to indicate different divisions within the text. Um, it could have been a reader's aid to help you find the start of a specific section within the composition. Um, for Greek pepperology, for example, it has been suggested that these signs were used more specifically also in an uh, oral context. So if one would be reciting or performing a text before an audience, someone would only have to remember something along the lines of second or third paragraph is signed down. And then you, when you turn back to the audience, you can count them and then return to the text. Anyway, this, this is an idea that has been proposed. Um, so finally, uh, below 4496, still on the verse of this manuscript, you find 4506 which survived in about 62 poorly preserved fragments. And 4506 is a second witness of works of the luminaries, which is a prayer cycle intended for liturgical use in the context of days of the week. Among other, uh, Esther Gazon has demonstrated common, the, demonstrated the common structure of these weekday prayers. And the, the structure of these prayers with these, again, these repetitive liturgical formulae is quite similar to 4509, which we discussed uh, before. So I would say that within the context of this Opus to F, it is significant that we find uh, two compositions on two sides of the same manuscript that display such a uh, common arrangement. Um, finally, also a brief remark on scribes. Um, I do think that at least two, but most probably all three compositions were written by different scribes. And in this regard, I would like to echo uh, Mladen Popovic's paper on Tuesday on the production of the Great Isaiah School and the involvement of uh, multiple scribes. So just to get back to that, uh, I think I would maintain that this epistograph shows us that there's more evidence for that, you know, the, the involvement of multiple scribes in the production of one manuscript. So uh, anyway, we move on. Um, the main point I wish to uh, emphasize is that the three compositions on these epistographs were uh, grouped together by the scribes behind the scrolls in antiquity and not by modern scholars. So this is a material certainty. Um, they are grouped together on the same manuscript. We can therefore conclude that at least on the level of individual scribes, these texts circulated together. That we find exactly these three compositions collectively is not self-evident. As we saw, festival prayers and words of the luminaries are usually characterized as non-sectarian compositions. Warsaw, however, is read as one of these core texts of this presumed sectarian community. So if we adopt this like kind of restricted sectarian conceptualization of the reading culture in which these compositions were disseminated, circulated, uh, then we might run into problems. Is our understanding of a textual community as sectarian still meaningful when we know that compositions with sectarian and non-sectarian religious ideas did not only exist together, but were read and studied collectively? Um, from such a perspective, it would be difficult, I would say, to explain why we would find these three compositions together on one manuscript. Instead, it seems that the diversity of texts that circulated together could be broader than this narrow, narrow sectarian versus non-sectarian dichotomy allows for. Um, this is, I think, intriguing and raises the question how meaningful our classifications are if they do not necessarily concur with our manuscript evidence. Rather than clarifying and opening up texts for interpretation, it seems that certain classifications that we try to impose on our manuscripts can narrow down our perspective of, on what Hindi Nyman has called this broad variety of text involving practices, both individual and communal. Prioritizing the manuscript evidence over preconceived classifications challenges us to think more about the setting in which these texts could have been read together. How then can this manuscript help us rethink the broad spectrum of reading practices and events in uh, ancient uh, Judaism? 
could this manuscript perhaps help us to get to a close understanding of certain aspects of a social reality of practices centered around these manuscripts. Um, in order to consider these questions, it is first of all important to reiterate that we have these three texts also on other manuscripts that were copied uh, during several centuries. So I would say that this tells us something, something interesting about the collecting practices that underlie the manuscript corpus and suggests a kind of a continued interest in these texts. Furthermore, um, if this opistograph was only produced to preserve these three texts, then we would have expected to find a copy of the complete compositions. This is not the case. Many fragments do not have text on the verso. So the final, fra final uh, 130 fragments of 4 to 5 or 9, the text on the recto, are blank or without text on the, on the back, on the verso. We can therefore conclude that, at least on the verso, only parts of the compositions were written down. We are dealing with extracts or selected passages. And extracts of texts point towards a different form of manuscript use than only preservation. Collecting extracts is evidence that these texts were act actively read and studied together, I would say. And this more dynamic engagement with texts is reflected in, well, we saw the scribal marking, markings in the margins, scribal corrections that we count on this manuscript. Furthermore, among others, Brian Schultz have pointed towards the many textual differences between 4496 on the verso and the text that passed down to us in uh, 1QM. We are not only dealing with extracts, but also with different redactions. And all of these different practices, note-taking, correcting, textual variety, variety, the collecting of extracts, are evidence for textual engagement on a high level. And this opistograph can therefore be characterized, I would say, as kind of the product of a living interaction with living texts. And the notion of living in this context is meaningful and ties in with how texts are perceived in scholarship from two different perspectives. The first one has to do with authorship. Part of Qumran research has been concentrated on the search for the ur text of the different compositions found in the caves. Fragmentary or more coarsely uh, produced exemplars are often used to reconstruct better preserved manuscripts in order to get to an original version of a given text. But less often are they seen as autonomous representatives of a kind of a living tradition in their own right. Uh, the second perspective uh, is somewhat related. The underlying assumption of a fixed and stable text is that the reading practices related to the text, and therefore also the ways in which, ancient, in which we think that ancient scribes engaged with their manuscripts, were also fixed. So the diversity, the heter heterogeneity that, is, that can be embedded in ancient reading culture is in this way a bit neglected. So, because also the perception of the text, right, can change over generations. And so do the different reading events that are concentrated around this text. So, this Qumran opistograph, I would suggest, displays a similar case for uh, textual variety. Extracts were selected and brought together from different compositions, both sectarian or perceived as sectarian and non sectarian, onto one manuscript which indicates that these texts were not only deposited together, but also actively read and discussed, perhaps by different people together. Mladen Popovic has shown how also within the scribal culture of the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's evidence for recitation and group reading as communal activities. I would say that the fact that several scribal hands were involved in the copying of these texts also suggests the collective engagement of multiple scribes. Manuscripts such as this opus to have hint, I think, to a diversity in the scribal engagement of texts. So uh, scholarship tends to group different redactions of a given composition together as one text within a uh, corpus of lit literature, sometimes neglecting the possibility that there could be different reading practices connected to each of these manuscripts manuscripts. 
It's calls such as 1QM might invite different types of reading activities than a uh, version of the Wars text on a pistograph. So this also, I would say, opens up questions about our understanding of issues such, such as genre. So by way of conclusion, I would like to reflect on this issue a bit more. In the process of bringing different texts together and reviving them, if you will, on a different manuscript and within the context of a different reading event, new made meaning can be created. Texts are always influenced by the texts around them. Um, I would propose that something similar is happening for the Qumran epistograph. We can evaluate uh, this manuscript not only as an intentional collection, but also one that imposes a way of reading onto itself. Collecting different texts together kind of reinforces the interpretive connections between those texts. And this process is also uh, active in many uh, manuscripts, such as this epistograph. Um, the pres presence of extracts from the war scroll together with extracts from prayer texts for these fixed occasions uh, invites us to think about this manuscript as kind of a liturgical document. But if we read the war scroll liturgically here, does that mean that we have to read 1QM as a prayer text as well? Well, this is possible and has been argued for in the past. But this epistograph kind of invites us also to think about the possibility of multiple genres. Could we not think of the war scroll both as a rule text and, for example, battle narrative, and as a liturgical document, depending on the other texts that we read next to it? So to conclude, clustering and categorizing uh, ancient texts, it's not a neutral affair, certainly not for the Dead Sea Scrolls. How we group different texts together influences our perception of each of those texts individually. So the perception of literary homogeneity or diversity is therefore a result of kind of the framework that we choose to operate with when we think about collections as a whole. However, epistographs can provide us uh, internal collections uh, of texts and help us in a way to critically think about our methods of clustering and separating texts from each other based on considerations from content and genre alone. So in this way, um, the study of scribal activity on manuscript level can help us to further reflect on the scribal culture and collecting practices of ancient collections. Thank you very much. Thanks for a very uh, paper with excellent uh, examples, very illuminating. Um, I've learned a lot uh, and I have a question about uh, how scribal practices relate to processes of both collection and composition. Uh, what's interesting about these manuscripts, uh, the manuscript that you described is that on the one side there's 4Q509 festival prayers and on the other side scholars distinguish between 4Q496, Milchama, the war scroll and 4Q506, words of Illuminary, but those are actually part of the same manuscript, right? So they have been divided by the editors, probably because that text was considered war scroll rather than belonging to the same composition. So the, when we think about dividing lines and textual limitations, uh, and uh, uh, rather, sorry, when we rather think of rewriting and texts being rewritten and, and an ongoing compositional process by collecting texts together, does that give us a, a different view on um, what those textual unities are? Uh, when you think, for example, also of the, uh, the rule of the community where we have different collections uh, in different versions, different parts being collected together. Um, so do we really, is that really milchama or is that a new co combination of two texts being brought together? The, the, does it help thinking in those categories? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's a wonderful question and a wonderful idea. And this is kind of what I try to hint to a little bit how, yeah, if you put extracts of different texts together on one manuscript, these interpretations are going to resonate perhaps, right? You're going to read them together and texts that you read together influence each other, especially with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, extracts on an, uh, 
uh, on an orchestra. But yeah, so I fully think we could perhaps almost push this forward and think of this orchestra as, as almost a new form or a new composition, or at least in the sense of that uh, we read things uh, differently when they're presented to us on a new uh, manuscript. And I like your observation as well that, our, that the uh, editorial decision to kind of uh, um, uh, publish them differently, separately, because indeed Fork 496 was published as a among the Warsaw uh, manuscripts and Festival Prayer with the Festival uh, Prayer manuscripts. Uh, there are good reasons for that, of course, but it, it, it also loses something. And that is kind of this, uh, the way that these texts can also be revived in a different way when they're brought together on this, on this uh, manuscript. So yes, so fully agree with it. Yeah. Thank you very much. There's uh, room for one final question. Uh, James, come on in. Great, thanks. Thanks for this paper. This is really interesting. Um, I, a long time ago, was going to, many, many years ago, was going to write my dissertation on something similar, but then turned in a different direction towards Elephantini. Um, but at Elephantini, we have a huge corpus that allows us to now determine how scribes are trained different genres were written on the material in different formations and for different reasons and different functions. Our literary texts are written, uh, we have one as an epistograph, one is not. We have the Ahikar text, and, which is not, but intentionally the writer seemed together two pap uh, papyrus scrolls just to make it one-sided, whereas the Darius text is an epistograph and then continues with uh, archival information of um, memoranda. What is, uh, what does this material nature, you showed some papyri and some parchments, what does the material nature and the, what we know about traditional scribal habits have to do with two compositions, for instance, perhaps informing each other or perhaps not on the same epistograph? It, it's clear that the Darius one there's no information. And what we have at Elephantini in Egyptian practices across all times and in Greek, the multiple uh, compiled epistographs don't necessarily have much to do with each other. So, yeah, it, it is. Um, so I think we have to distinguish and this is what scholarship has done as well before between kind of these reused uh, manuscripts where we find kind of two different or multiple different compositions that are not necessarily related to each other, as we think. So there are many examples from Egypt of uh, documentary texts that are reused uh, uh, for literary texts, for, for example, or for other documentary texts. In fact, texts. almost all, by the way, in yes. the late period, all Absolutely. literary texts are almost always on reused papyrus. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and there, so I'm not saying that there has to be an intentionality in collecting these texts. Uh, uh, in every case, but in some times, so what I try to demonstrate with this uh, case a little bit is that if you see these parallels between, let's say, liturgical texts from both sides, you can think of it as kind of a uh, an intentional collection. And as you brought up the, the material nature of uh, papyrus, so this topograph that I showed here is a papyrus, which is uh, a minority of the only minority of the totally total of the Dead Sea Scrolls, of course, is written on papyrus. So that also might be, there might be a decision in there in the choice of writing material. So that is certainly also a, uh, a aspect in that. Uh, does this answer your question a little bit? It helps, yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. Nice. Thank you. Um, I see Hindi also has a, a brief follow-up question. Hindi, if it's very brief, there's still time or we can leave it for the discussion later. It is very brief. It's exactly on, on the point that James just mentioned. So Ihan, I, I appreciated the paper. I I want to just talk, um, just, just to ask you to reflect for a moment about the way in which your paper contributes to, to meaning, um, which I'll hopefully talk about a little bit later. But the, the, the point is that you're offering a series of possibilities, a repurposing texts as liturgical or as study texts or other, right? Um, literary texts, whatever that would mean. And, um, but secondly, that 
um, you, you of course are leaving open the possibility of what James presents, but also um, taking very seriously, for example, George Brooks' work on liturgical performance um, in the context of reading these texts. So what collection means, there's not a single answer. And I wanna just get kind of some clarification in, in response also to your response to James that you're offering um, a kind of a panoply of possibilities for what, what it could look like, what, what, what to do with new forms of collection using the material work, which is obviously the core of your research and your dissertation, but also extending it to larger literary implications not not unlike Drew's paper earlier uh, in the conference. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that is really indeed what I try to do. So opening up these uh, possibilities and thinking about multiple uh, genres as well with the point I try to make a bit at the end of the uh, of my presentation. And uh, I try to look at uh, uh, as you said, at the material reality, reality we find. So these um, little scribal markings that I showed that you see in the margin, it has been proposed that these could be used in kind of a, a, an oral context. So I try to think it. So uh, there are all kinds of possibilities with regard to this manuscript, uh, indeed, as you, uh, as you said, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, so much. Thank you very much, Ihan. We'll continue later in the general discussion. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.